Trek Geeks Podcast Network is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the home for amazing pin collectibles with over 300 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every month. Stay tuned for a special discount code worth 10% off your next order at fansets.com. Fansets, our pins have character. Unwanted friends work together to escape an awesome new starship, and some enemies that are sure to be a force to be reckoned with. The newest Star Trek series debuted with a pew pew. So let's jump into a class D loader to the nearest ramp and escape to a place to discuss it all. My name is Mike Bovia, and this is Discovering Trek Prodigy. Thanks for joining us on Discovering Trek, the Star Trek Universe Companion, presented by Fansets. We've been waiting a long time for the latest entry in the Star Trek Universe, but it was so worth the wait. And when I say we, it's because I'm not the target audience for Prodigy, so I do need a little help with this one. Now, there's an old, outdated saying that says, behind every man is a strong woman. Uh, Well, that certainly doesn't fit the bill in our case, because I'm always the one that's riding her coattails. She is my progeny, Emily. Emily, how are you? Are you ready to hit the first episode of Prodigy? I've been ready for a while. And that's it. She's so, she's, she has so many words to regale us with. So let's, let's, uh, get you talking a little bit more and you can tell us where to find us on the online realms you can follow the show on twitter at discovering trek and you can find us on twitter at trek legacy and on instagram with the same handle you can also find us in camp kittimer from time to time if you'd like to join the conversation there answer a couple simple questions and you'll be welcomed in by our admins Haley, jackie and fark you can subscribe to the podcast by downloading the trek geeks mobile app or by searching for us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. So as Em and I were talking about how we wanted to put this show together, we thought it would be a good idea to give a voice to those to whom this show was intended, that being the younger generation. Uh, That said, we couldn't make that happen for this episode, so we did the next best thing. Uh, We got a couple of guys who think and act like the younger generation. So, hey! Welcome the executive producers of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network, Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. Welcome back to uh, being able to be on Discovering Trek and Dan not having the hosting responsibilities. It's a wonderful thing. It's it's great to be here. I got to tell you, I'm really excited about this, not only because we finally have Prodigy to watch and we've been waiting for this for so long, but I got to tell you, I think it's really unique in what you guys have done, Mike and, and Emily, having someone younger who is already part of the star trek uh family to get her unique perspective on the show that's already geared towards a younger audience so i'm i'm ecstatic i'm really happy to be here even though mike's here as well and even to even make it worse bill's here with me too hi buddy hey you know it's really (laughs) neat to be a guest on our own podcast which i've never had happen before um but i'm excited to talk about uh, episodes one and two of prodigy I think there's a lot here and I, I think that, well, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it, but I'm going to, I think this is the best Star Trek series premiere of all time. I was feeling the same way when I, when I watched it, but I didn't, I was trying not to let my thoughts influence uh, that younger generation I was talking about. Uh, so before we go any further, let's give a reminder that this episode of discovering Trek provides spoilers for the Prodigy episode, Lost and Found. So if you have not watched that episode yet, head over to Paramount Plus, watch the episode, and then head back and see what Emily, and not as much me, has to say about Prodigy. Failure to do so leaves you open to spoilers from episode one. So Em, can you regale us with an episode synopsis of Lost and Found? You meet a group of unwanted on the mining colony Tars Lamora. 
Dal makes a deal with Gwen, the diviner's daughter, to be able to leave by turning in Fugitive Zero. Teamed with a huge alien he can't communicate with, Dal discovers the USS Protostar and a means to communicate. Zero finds Dal and Rock Talk, telling them they will need a crew, which will include a Tellarite, Jankum Pog, and Murph. Dal is recaptured and escapes with Gwen's assistance to lead Dreadnought to the Protostar. The crew defeats Dreadnought and escapes the colony, finding they have a helper on board. Awesome. So uh, we will get into some of the minute details that were provided in that episode synopsis. But first, uh, let's get everyone's thoughts on this episode. And I see Dan wagging his finger at me. So we'll let I, him go I first. Actually have a, I have an actual question before we start with, with what our thoughts are. And that's, Bill, why can't you do synopsis as good as that? That was fantastic. I mean, you got you to gotta step it up when we're doing Discovery in a few weeks, buddy. I'd like to think that I operate within my skill set, and I think that pretty much just says it all. <laughs> okay. And, up, and with that said. <laughs> so his skill set is lower than a 12-year-old. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but since Dan was wagging his finger, we're going to get his thoughts on the episode first. Well, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, what Bill said surprised me. I didn't, I didn't know that he felt so strongly about this premiere episode of the newest Star Trek series. I thought it was absolutely phenomenal. The everything from the animation to the voice work uh, to the story is, is amazing. I think it is, I think it is the best way to introduce younger generations to the Star Trek universe. I am all for this episode and I cannot wait to see what happens to this new crew during the whole season. I, I can't help but agree with you and you also, Bill, in saying, you know, this was by far at this point, I mean, they hit a home run on the first swing here. Um, Dan and Kevin Hageman, you know, they obviously know what they're doing in appealing to the younger audience. Uh, without a doubt. I mean, there are going to be the inevitable comparisons to some of the Star Wars animated series, like Clone Wars, like Rebels. And I think that at this point, that's the highest of compliments. I think that Star Trek Prodigy comes in and sets out what it intended to do from the get-go, which is to introduce a younger audience to the principles of Star Trek and to the universe. And I don't think they honestly could have done it any better. I think it fires in all cylinders. I think we get great introductions to our main characters um, both for kids and for adults who, and, and for Trekkies, quite frankly, uh, I think it covers all three bases really adeptly. And uh, I, I honestly can't wait to see where these characters go. And M, knowing that you have watched uh, both Clone Wars and Rebels, I mean, what, what is your thought as far as comparisons go between this and those shows? Because I know you and I talked about it a little bit when we initially watched it. Yeah, it definitely reminds me of it um, in two ways. The art style and the way that it's animated is reminds me of it, the way that it's lifelike but still cartoony and it's 3D, but it doesn't look, you know. Yeah, it's different from yeah. the animation style is far different from Lower Decks. Yeah, like you said, in that it's 3D quality as opposed to that 2D uh, drawing style. Hmm. Yeah, and it also reminds me of that in the sense that it's geared towards kids, but it has an appeal to a wider audience as well. Because Rebels, I feel like anybody could watch it and enjoy it, but I feel like it was still geared towards kids. It's it's interesting that you say that, Emily. I don't. I I may be the only person of the four of us that has not seen Rebels and has not seen Clone Wars yet. I haven't seen those. But what I found interesting is while I was watching this first episode, I was reminded of several Star Wars things in this episode. Um, the planet reminded me of Mustafar, Mustafar a little bit, and when um, we saw the Diviner in his container it reminded me of when darth vader was in that container and even when luke was in his container um getting um healed when when he got injured um and and i and i i like that i don't want to compare i certainly don't want to compare star trek and star wars but i like how with an animated series like rebels and clone wars that's already happened that 
people are already picking up some Star Wars things. Pe- Bill, I think you said that um, we hope that this is a series like the animated Star Wars series because they were so good. Well, and I think the highest compliment is in the writing. Mm-hmm. I think that what separated Rebels and Clone Wars was the fact that the writing for those series was not only on target for the Star Wars universe, but it was on target for its audience. And I think that Prodigy has taken that and elevated it even further. It's not only on target for its audience, it's on target for anybody that wants to watch this show, whether you know Star Trek or don't, whether you're a kid or you're not. I think that they are casting a wide net here and they're telling a story incredibly well, even in just the first episode. Yeah. And along those lines, and we'll get into it later. I mean, even in this first episode, you can see that it's uh, following Star Trek's uh, prototype of being able to teach a lesson as well. And in this case, you know, giving that lesson to the younger generation without it uh, to quote you guys, without it being bonk bonk on the head uh, as far as, uh, you know, putting that, that lesson out there for, uh, for the audience, you know, I really enjoyed uh, the comedic aspect of it because it's the things seem to come at just the right time. Uh, You know, like cat boots, Uh, you know, as soon as I heard that I cracked (laughs) up. Um, But uh, you know, the one that caught me like, and I think it's the one that I laughed the loudest at was um, yeah, I know I'm big. I'm not dumb. And it it probably caught me the best because uh, Emily said, Hey, I'm going to apply that to you now for the rest of your life. (laughs) <laughs> well, except what i said was you are big and dumb yeah exactly Ouch. <laughs> okay wow the, hey it's it's the, it's the family dynamic <laughs> no i'm just made she's being that honest <laughs> i'm not i'm not <laughs> see this is why you have to have her on as the third guest on trek geeks because you'll find out just how brutally honest she is um but I'll tell you what I'll tell you what else I really liked is, um, you know, I when I saw that Jason Manzukis was cast uh, to play a role in this show, I was a little concerned just because of knowing what his roles have been in other shows. And yet, you know, uh, the line, that he, the line that he gives Gwyn, uh, you know, Making a series of bad decisions, yeah, Jankum Pog knows. I mean, that was that was Jason Manzukis, every character he's ever played, right there, and perfect for the younger audience. And doesn't it make it wonderful knowing that you can have people that were in these these other roles that the um, being able to be a voiceover in an animated series can you can hide that and wipe it away completely. So nobody even knows. Cause I have not seen Jason in, in roles that are off the top of my head that I can think of right now. I just love the voice and I love the character, which we'll get into a little bit later about how much I love Jank and Pog. When he was added to this cast, I was, I was secretly kind of psyched because obviously I, I I'm almost always doing a continual rewatch of parks and recreation, almost like I'm doing the office all the time. And I mean, Jason also turns up in things like uh, I'm sorry with Andrea Savage and he always plays these characters that are insanely funny, but you're right. I mean, they've got an element of them that is clearly more on the adult side of things. Um, but it, I think that he brings a, a humanity to this Tellerite and a, a sense of humor that I think is really necessary for that particular role. I think he's going to wind up being, you know, sort of the, the, the comic relief in some scenes as we expect. And I think there's other times he's probably going to be the really serious character. And that's really kind of what I'm hoping for. Yeah. I was very surprised as well with how different it was from what else I've seen him in. Like it was such a dramatic change. Definitely. She, she is, she is not uh, watch Brooklyn nine, nine yet, but when I think Adrian (laughs) Pimento, uh, you know, (laughs) yes. but she has watched The Good Place and she's watched Parks and Rec. So she knows him from both of those. But okay. Adrian Pimento is a level above his other two characters. There. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> so uh, one other thing, and I'm going to put you guys on the spot because I did not include this in the outline. It kind of came fluidically as I was doing notes is uh, 
there was a small number of callbacks uh, within this for the long-term Star Trek fan, you would say. Uh, what did you guys pick up on uh, throughout for those callbacks? I, I love the idea that there's a Medusa as one of the main casts. Uh, I thought that was brilliant. And I also love that when they were doing a flashback as to what was happening with Zero when they were first captured, one of the first or the only alien that they showed uh, seeing them in their true form and going insane was a, a Morn a Morn alien. I, and the name is escaping me at the moment, but I thought Lurian. that was a great. Yeah, I, got, I thought that was a great uh, callback to uh, some of the other Star Trek series we've seen in the past. I have to agree with that. I mean, I, I think that, especially in that scene, Dan, since you brought it up, that scene is really kind of deep and dark. It is. Yeah. Yep. You know, and it's, it, and that, that really is a great illustration of what I was talking about before. You know, the average kid watching this show can understand what's going on and understand that, you know, this character was put in a situation he didn't want to be in. The rest of us who've been watching Star Trek for 50 years or, or pretty close to it are like, wow, he was used as a torture device against his will. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's going to leave some marks. Uh, that's going to have some, some scars that I think need healing as best they can. And that's really the kind of thing that excites me about this. I mean, not the least of which is when you want to talk to the ultimate Starfleet callback, we get hologram Janeway at the end, which really makes me um, more excited than I ever thought possible. Plus, if you look at some of the ship graphics, like really, really close up. There's a reference to a trans warp drive. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to see where that technology has come since Star Trek three, the search for Spock. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm actually glad you pointed that out because uh, I think one of the things that I had said, I thought might be the case with uh, the proto star when M and I did our first episode was I thought it might be a quantum slipstream drive going back to um I can't remember the Voyager episode off the top of my head, but yeah, trans warp drive. So we'll have, it'll be interesting. Maybe the, maybe the third nacelle is necessary to make it work. Yeah. We'll see. I also like the fact that right at the very beginning of this episode that takes place in the Delta quadrant, we have a Kazon show up. Mm -hmm. I thought that was pretty cool too. And we got to actually hear the Kazon language. If memory serves for the first time, I thought that was pretty cool as well. M, uh, I know you and I had a conversation about the Kazon at the beginning. Uh, what were your thoughts on the overall look of that Kazon? I'm going to be completely honest. I do not remember what he looked like. But I'm sure you remember that he looked better in animation than the Kazon looked in 100%. 100%. <laughs> 100%. Oh, I, I thought that this was probably the most fearsome Kazon we've ever seen. And I... <laughs> I, I don't mean to knock Voyager because I love Voyager, but um, I thought it was quite an interesting treatment. I think that hearing their language made them a little more scary. Yeah. Um, as opposed to them being on a planet where they can make all kinds of things, but don't have water, which I never right. understood. Yep. So, yep. Uh, so you guys covered most of the callbacks I had, but one thing that jumped off the page at me, uh, it was toward the end. Uh, Dahl is talking to Gwen after they've captured her and he makes the comment in different circumstances, we could have been friends. Yeah. And right away, I was like, oh, balance of terror. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yep. It's it's clearly obvious that, you know, the Hageman brothers and, and everybody associated with Prodigy has a deep and abiding love of Star Trek. It, it's obvious from the moment this thing starts. Mm -hmm. And to get little callbacks like that and some of the other ones, which I'm sure will be regaled with as the season unfolds it just it makes my trekkie heart happy and that and 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 to add to that bill the very very first scene of prodigy that we ever seen we get that familiar that familiar music that we love so much i mean the the music in the entire episode is great but to have that original series um series of tones that we're so used to open this this show on its first episode i thought was another amazing callback Please specify how you would like to proceed, sir. So we've reached our Starfleet Academy portion of the show. And uh, to give you a little bit of background, Star Trek has always tried to teach the audience something about itself. And that is no different, as we've already discussed, with Prodigy bringing that to the next generation. So we're going to start off with you, Bill. Uh, in your opinion, what is this episode trying to teach either uh, you or the younger audience? 
Well, I, I'm going to just go with the viewer in general, because I don't know if I'm smart enough to get half the lessons it's going to try to tell me. You know, I started thinking a lot about the, the asteroid of, of Tars Lamora. And, and actually, it's an anagram for star amoral. And I think that that place truly seems to be just that. I think it's a very amoral place. Kids are held prisoner and forced to engage in the most dangerous and laborious of hard work. And there is just no hope on Tars Lamora. But there is hope in the stars. And I think that this episode is trying to tell us just that. That despite our differences and despite the things that make us unique as individuals, we can come together and we can be something more or something greater. And I think that's the best possible way to set up this sort of ragtag crew. There is hope. And I think that that's what they're going to find aboard the Protostar. And that's going to be the, the crux of their adventures. Very nice. And you're not giving yourself enough credit if you're taking a long name like Tars Lamora and making the anagram of it, because I, I would have never seen that. Oh, that's that's what discovering Trek's all about, baby. I don't even know what an anagram is. There you uh, go. It's t- time for you to Google. There's your homework <laughs> for this week. <laughs> okay, Dan Davidson, what lesson were you taught? I, I don't know if I could top that. That was pretty deep, man. That was awesome. Um, but the one that stands out to me, it, and it kind of goes throughout the entire episode as we're meeting these new characters, and that's something that people are told when they're young. Don't judge a book by its cover. I mean, we see it throughout. I mean, we see it when, uh, when Dahl is kind of looking at zero and his clunky, you know, put together robotic, um, outfit that he's wearing so that he can protect, uh, him, uh, themselves from being seen and by others and going mad. And of course we see it with rock talk, um, and how Dahl is thinking he's this big oafish giant, uh, and always calling him a him. And then, oh, we find out it's just this young female version of the of this alien race. Um, and I think that's important. I mean, Bill and I have talked for a long time about doing some kind of project where we bring that into a storyline of don't judge a book by its cover just because the way somebody looks doesn't mean that they are mean or evil or, or whatnot. And I think that's an important message here. Um, and as a, as a 1A or 2B, see what I did there? Um, I'm thinking that another message, which I think we're going to see a lot in Prodigy, is that message of teamwork. You're not alone. You got to work together in order to succeed. And I think we see that right off the bat with this crew um, when they're getting uh, things getting going on the Protostar. And I'm going to say that that right there was the smartest opinion of the night uh, because that is exactly what I had written down. So that's why it's so smart. Uh, <laughs> so uh, instead of me uh, just repeating that, I'm going to work with M on hers because uh, it's something that her and I actually talked about uh, when we were doing our notes. So M, what was your thought on the lesson involved in this episode for younger ones? Um, communication is key in terms of if you want somebody to do something for you, can't manipulate them into doing it because we see that with the um um the diviner, the diviner and gwen sorry i didn't remember his name when i had to look through no my problem. notes um and he's telling her to go do all this stuff to get the proto star but he's not telling her and he's saying she's not ready to learn yet that's not what you're supposed to do if you want somebody to do something for you. And it's not safe or smart. And you could lose their trust if you have it. And that's not bad for off the top of your head and not having your notes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I don't, I don't know what I can add to that, except, uh, you know, I looked at it from the, from the parent side, um, you know, the diviner and we actually get a name for him um, at one point. And the only reason I know that is because I was, I was watching it with uh, subtitles today. So Gwyn is referred to as the progeny of Solemn. And so the diviner would be her father. She's the pro the progeny. So Solemn, the diviner. So he 
it, as M said, he's not, he, he's only training her to do what he wants her to do instead of giving her the proper training. Um, he's holding back what he knows about the Federation because he obviously sees what kind of heart his daughter has and he wants her to stick along with him instead. So he's holding back this knowledge of the Federation and using her as a tool to be able to find things out for him. And, um, you know, M, if I ever use you as a tool to do things for me, except take the trash out and mow the lawn, uh, you better you better tell me so that uh, I correct that action. Because looking at that, that is not the example that I want to set as a parent. And it's definitely the last thing that I want my child to think of me, which is what you see kind of in Gwen's face toward the end when she realizes that the diviners known about the proto star this whole time. Well, I don't think you're ever going to want to use me because as Kevin said, I'm a nice kid, but I'm not the sharpest tool in the drawer. Quoting the office too, man. Wow. I did. I, that's talk about deep cut level. I, my hat's off to Emily. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to bring out one thing in regards to what you talked about a moment ago, Emily, which I think is really important. And I think it's good for, for prodigy and it shows how much of a bad guy villain this diviner is going to be. First of all, at one point he mentions to Gwen that they are the last of their kind. So does that mean they're the only two of this race left? And yet a father manipulates a daughter to do his bidding without telling him what's going on. It's one thing if you've got a bad guy and he's manipulating the crew or something like that, but this is his own flesh and blood that he's doing it to. And it just makes him as a villain, all that much worse, in my opinion. I'm going to agree with that straight up. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that there are levels to the diviner that we just can't possibly grasp right now. I mean, if he's willing to use zero as an implement of torture and he's willing to manipulate and control his own daughter this way, what else is he capable of? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and more importantly, is he under some kind of duress? We don't know that yet. You know, we saw him sort of plugged into whatever it was that that he was connected to with those three um, uh, connections coming into his back. Mm -hmm. is, is he doing this of his own volition or is he being controlled? Uh, that's that's a question we don't know the answer to yet. Mm. That sounds like something for the trans warp conduit later. <laughs> mm, mayhaps. <laughs> to take a moment now to talk about our friends at Fansets, the presenting sponsor of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. Did you know that it's been five years since Fansets has been providing us with top-notch merchandise? It's hard to believe, but in that time, they've been providing us with offerings for all different types of fandoms, including Scooby-Doo, DC Comics, Batman 66, Harry Potter, and Rick and Morty. And Prodigy looks like it's going to offer a ton of awesome pin ideas for Lou, John, and the Fansets team. In fact, we've already seen in episode one a cool Delta badge. Uh, is that something that maybe we can expect soon, guys? Uh, maybe this one will have a universal translator that's going to help us understand Dan on Trek Geeks. Keep an eye on fansets.com for that and over 300 officially licensed Star Trek pins, including the aforementioned Delta Collection, as well as Micro Crew, Episode Pins, and many other great designs. So, as Bill would say, since he's our guest, put a whole bunch of pins in your cart at fansets.com. As a listener to the show, you can receive 10% off your next order from Fansets by using the code DISCOVERINGTREK at checkout. And remember that you receive free shipping in the U.S. on orders $30 or more. Fansets. Our pins have character. And we thank Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of the Trek Geeks Podcast Network. We're now going to transition into 
what we loved best about this episode. And one of the things that I think we all agree on is that uh, Christopher Pike is definitely worthy of the, of the title of the Medal of Honor. So that's going to be the name of this section. Christopher Pike Medal of Honor section. Uh, our favorite things from this week's episode. It can be characters, the animation, the writers, anything involved. So just by process of elimination, the girl who likes to go last is going to go first here. So M, well, what were some of the things that were your favorite bits of this episode? Well, one of the things that I really liked was the animation. I love art. It's something that I've always been into. I tried animation once. I was the worst at it and I get it. I'm 12, but I couldn't make it move half as smooth as this is. This is beautiful. It's smooth. It's clean and it's lifelike and I love it. And it looks real. It looks like you're seeing it from a camera because of the way that the perspective changes so cleanly as well. Like it doesn't like go down or up or anything. It just smooths down, you know? Transition. Yeah. You know what I'm trying to say? I do. And I think Bill does too, because the whole time he was shaking his head. I, I agree. There's there's an absolute cinematic quality to Prodigy that I really kind of respect and admire. And I think that that's that's exactly related to Emily's point. Um, it's it just it it looks like it ought to be a feature film. It's it's fantastic. Um this ties in with the animation. The art is amazing too. And again, I know I'm only 12, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it as good as this. This is beautiful. Mm, you're getting there. And uh <laughs> oh ye of little faith. Anything else? Yeah, this is um compliment to Nami Malumad. The music fits perfectly with every scene. It's beautiful. It brings life to the scene even more so. And I can't imagine what the show would be like without the music because it just fits so well that it feels like it is part of the show and it belongs there. And it it's amazing. And I love music too, but I could never do this or anything close to it. Yeah, I think I made the comment that the music is like another character in the show with this. I agree with that. Uh, Emily, I'd point out to you that you, you keep prefacing your comments with, I know I'm only 12. You know what? At some point, the writers and the artists and the animators of the show were 12 themselves. And I'll bet that at that point, they didn't think they would be doing this. So don't sell yourself short. I, I think that um, you can pretty much do whatever you want to. And I think that watching Star Trek Prodigy is 100% proof of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm going to jump in on that as well and say, keep in mind that that she is the first female to be the composer of a Star Trek series, which is another awesome step in the right direction. Absolutely. Should have happened a lot long time ago, but it happened now. So that's another thing to look forward to. All these great things are happening uh, with Star Trek um, and, and going in the way that we should be going. So keep that in mind too. And plug, 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 keep this in mind. Uh, Emily and I had a conversation with Nami regarding her being the first composer in uh, star trek history so keep an eye out for that as uh discovering trek rolls along i can't wait for that conversation it's going to be fantastic yeah it is one other reason that i say i probably can't do that is because i don't play anything like that i play kind of the guitar i can't say that i play it i know how to pluck the strings um i play the piano and i play the drums and i can kind of play the kalimba but that I don't even know if anybody knows what that is. You can already do a whole bunch of things more than Dan and I can. Yep. So you've got a great <laughs> head start. I guarantee you, I couldn't do any of that when I was 12. How about you, Dan? I Nope. And I still can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so far talking during this podcast, you've had a firm grasp on the English language. So you're already a step up with some of these guys. Way yeah. Both of us step ahead. Yep. Both of us. <sighs> All right, Mr. Davidson, you're up. Uh, what did you, what were some of your faves from this episode? 
Yeah, in, in no particular order, except the last one's going to be my favorite. But uh, I got to I gotta agree with what Emily said, and I'm pretty sure that both of you guys are going to say the same thing. The animation in this series is just amazing. It's on a whole nother level. I mean, uh, I'm not putting down any other types of animation. I love the animation in Lower Decks, but this animation in Prodigy is something that I didn't expect. And it is it is cinematic. It is big screen type animation. And you can see it in every single scene, whether it's somebody's eyes and how fluid they look um, to just the way that the atmosphere is and how explosions take place. I got to give credit to all the animators because um, it's simply breathtaking. I also got to say, uh, Jankum Pog is one of my favorite characters. I think what Jason's doing is awesome. The animation for, for Jankum is great. That he's a Tellarite is another awesome thing. Another great callback that we talked about a little while ago, different callbacks in, in, in Prodigy. And I love his arm that can or his mechanical appendage that can change into different things. I have a feeling that that's going to come in very useful as the mm-hmm. season goes on, as he seems to be who will be the chief engineer Uh, of the proto star. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, But I got to say my, my highest uh, commendation with the Christopher Pike medal of honor is to John Noble and the diviner. And I have a feeling that that's going to be happening a lot with me this season. His voice is pure mellifluousness in a bottle. It is just, it is wonderful to listen to. He's going to play this character so well i mean he is he's so good in everything he's done from lord of the rings to fringe to he was in the boys last season for an episode and and a tv show that i loved uh, back in the early uh, 2010s sleepy hollow he's so good and he's now part of the star trek universe forever john noble is star trek canon and i just love that ha- having chatted a little bit back and forth with you i knew john noble was going to be on your list Mm -hmm. Uh, but you're you're absolutely right um you don't even have to see what he looks like like you were saying his voice it's screaming villain the whole way throughout this episode uh so yeah definite kudos to uh to john noble in this one okay william what are you looking for Uh, to award this week well you know i have to say right up front uh dan and and kevin hageman the writers of this particular episode the creators and the executive producers of star trek prodigy they get my first ever christopher pike medals of honor i love the introductions of our main characters in this episode i think it's done so well it's all very creative and i love how they establish how completely different this young group of aliens is from each other i think that's really important in the scope of of laying the groundwork for the series because everything that happens after that after this depends on on that particular aspect that said i also have to give a special citation to the backstory for the character zero we talked a little bit about it before i am totally team zero I do love Jank and Pog like Dan does, but I have a special place in my heart for Zero because I love that original series episode, Is There in Truth No Beauty, um, where the Medusans are introduced. Diana Muldaur, I mean, come on. Um, but it, here we have a really, really heavy story that Star Trek fans can sink their teeth into, and I think this is just some top-notch writing right there. And then lastly, I have to say, My last Christopher Pike Medal of Honor for this week goes to the USS Protostar. My word, what a gorgeous waiting for that (laughs) and beautiful ship. I need one. Uh, CBS, John Van Sitters, uh, I need a USS Protostar like yesterday because that thing needs to be on my shelf right next to my Enterprise. That's how much I love that ship. And those are my Christopher Pike Medals for this week such an awesome design that it is it, yeah. you know uh, it's it it puts uh, to in my mind it's putting together all the designs the evolution of designs we've seen going forward into this just beautiful ship uh you know i also had the proto star on mine uh but i i made sure to put a number of things down just in case uh, some of you guys stole my ideas like uh, davidson did earlier tonight so mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh but despite that i do have to definitely give one of my awards to the hageman brothers for this episode um i mean first off thanks guys because we know you're listening to this episode um, we definitely are on board 
I don't think we can say it enough in this episode that this is the best debut episode of Star Trek thus far. So, I mean, kudos, guys. Um, You know how to weave a story that is interesting for the target audience that you're looking at, but also the lifelong fans and the parents that are going to be watching it with the kids. Um, Next, uh, I'm going to echo my daughter and I'm going to give a hats off to Nami Malumad uh, and her music in this, because as I said a couple of times, uh, this score is another integral character in the show. Um, You know, there's a few times where I was on the edge of my seat wondering what was going to happen. And then the score hit me and, you know, knock, knock me off my feet again. So great, great score. And, uh, you know, looking forward to hear more of what uh, Nami has in store for us and a little plug for her uh, each week, they're going to be releasing the score from the episodes to your favorite downloadable areas. Mm -hmm. So if you liked the music from lost and found, it should be available at the time of this of this episode being posted. So check it out. And my last one, um, I'm hoping that this person gets tons of notoriety throughout this season. And that's Riley Alizaraki uh, as Rock Talk. You know, Riley is someone who is within that target audience. Uh, she is going to be relatable, I think, to so many kids And quite honestly, the character of Rock Talk uh, herself is a relatable character, I think, to a lot of kids. Uh, Some of the things in her profile talk about her love of animals and everyone wanting a fair chance. And that is right in line with uh, with kids thinking. So, uh, Riley, we hope that you're listening and we hope that uh, you'll come visit us someday on Discovering Trek. But, you know, beside that, even if you don't, a top-notch job in this and welcome to being now a legend in the star trek universe two things i have to say one i agree with you about nami malumad but you copied me you had to copy me but anyways dad (laughs) hey i told i said at the beginning i'm riding her coattails man if Riley Alzraki comes to visit which i think is a very slim chance she won't visit us she'll visit me You'll just be here. Guess you put you on notice. I know, right? Guys, I love all of these Christopher Pike Medals of Honor, but um, I'd like to throw in one special one if I could. And I'm going to, since I'm an executive producer in the network, so you don't get to say no. Um, I'm going to throw in his later round. (laughs) Starfleet Award of Valor. Let's just get it right out of the way. Who was not ecstatic hearing Kate Mulgrew return as Janeway as hologram Janeway. That voice is so, is so distinct and so wonderful. And having her back in this show is amazing. I was, I am so happy for Kate. I'm so happy for Voyager fans. I'm so happy for Star Trek fans that we get her again. Uh, And even though she was only in a couple of, of quick moments at the end of this episode, she was fantastic. I have to believe that she the hologram Janeway is going to be the glue that sort of binds Mm -hmm. everything together. Yes. Um, And I I mean, who better to introduce these principles of star star Trek and Starfleet and the Federation to, to this young group of kids than somebody as iconic as Catherine Janeway herself. I I think it's, I think it's amazing. I got to say, I am very, uh, you mentioned Dan, how little she was actually in this episode. I got to say, I'm very happy with that in this initial episode. Oh, me too. Just because of, uh, you know, my fear when I heard that she was going to be on was it might steal something away from the main characters. And they definitely did not do that, which was perfect. Mm -hmm. Uh, We get to know all the main characters first and then she comes. Yes. So like like Bill was saying, she's going to help bind these characters together. Mm -hmm. I agree 100%. And I'm still enraged. 
All right. So the trans warp conduit to the Delta Quadrant, because we know how much Bill and Dan love those trans warp conduits. Uh, but it's far easier than just saying, give me your prediction. So based on this week's episode and well, at this point, we don't have previous storylines. What do you think could happen next week or later this season? So, Bill, we'll have you go first. Well, well you know, it's it's good. Like you said, there's there's really only one episode under our belts. I'm not really quite sure what's going to happen next week yet in the scope of this, other than, you know, they're going to continue to be pursued by the Diviner. But I touched on it a little bit earlier, and I think this is true. I think we're going to find the Diviner isn't necessarily the big bad. I, I think that maybe he's... Uh, being controlled by somebody else. Um, now, really, the the secret to these is that on, on Discovering Trek, when we talk about Star Trek Discovery, we admit right off the bat that our predictions are almost always wrong. And I'm comfortable with this being 100% wrong. But if I had to make a guess today, if I had to say, I think this could happen, I think this could happen. I think we could find that uh, there is somebody even worse than the diviner out there. And our intrepid crew, unfortunately, may come to find that later in the season. He's he's spelling doom and gloom for us already in episode one. My God, talk about dropping the hammer. Well, it's it's not necessarily doom and gloom. It's, you know, there, there's always got to be a boss level, right? That's right. Exactly. I saw, um, well, I don't know what I was going to say with that sentence, but um, I going off of your theory i hadn't even thought of it before but i wrote down in my thoughts that it seemed like gwen was kind of afraid of her father i mean she wouldn't even call her or call him her father in front of him and i feel like that if your idea comes to be then I feel like that might be why she might not even know it, but he might be a pretty good guy in reality, but this is making her scared of him. And I feel like we might see that and might, you know, go on to future episodes, but I don't. Yeah. I think it's a definite possibility. Um, And of course, again, I admit I freely could be 100% wrong, (laughs) which we're used to. (laughs) <laughs> Same here. So, M, what is your uh, thought as to what could happen going forward in the season? Um, I did not come up with anything rock solid for this because I have no idea what's in the future of this. It's hard for me to say. So... I'm not 100% sure, which is rare for me because I'm normally pretty sure about stuff like this, but I, I can't, can't tell you what, what I think because Make it I up. don't know what I think. So, Make so it what up. you're no. saying is, is you don't have anything that's rock talk solid. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. He's never going to be a guest on this show again. I can see it now. <laughs> In fact, I think Bill just pulled your hosting rights for the future too. <laughs> <sighs> anyway. So, so not e- not even a conspiracy theory, huh? No. Oh. And it really hurts me to say that <laughs> because I love theories, but I blank. She doesn't have enough solid basis to uh, to form a coherent thought on just yet. <laughs> Which is weird because it was forty five minutes long, but. Okay, uh, Mr. Rock Talktastic, Dan <laughs> Davidson. Uh, I got a, I got a couple of things. One of them is something I hope to see, but doesn't have necessarily have to do with the forward storyline of Prodigy. I want to know how the Protostar got to where it was, how long it was there, why, what happened to the crew. I'd love to get a backstory on this amazing looking, experimental looking NX Protostar. Um, so I hope that that happens, but I want to go back to something that both Bill and M were talking about, and that's the diviner. This is something that's, this is going to be a complicated character. I think one of two things I would like to see happen, and I'm not sure which one I, I like better one. He is going to do something really, really bad to his daughter, or 
at the end, as we've seen in a lot of movies and TV shows with the real big bad guy at the very end comes to the realization of how bad he was and wants to make things right. And he's going to sacrifice himself to save his daughter. One of those two possibilities. I'm not sure which one yet though. Mm, That's I'd say that's pretty deep, but as you said, it happens in a lot of things, but I hadn't even thought of, I hadn't even thought of that. So that's a good point. So uh, my, my theory, my prediction is uh, we've seen doll so far in this episode and he's pretty sure of himself uh, almost to a fault at times. Um, And I think that going forward that, arrogance will say that he's got is not just going to get him into trouble. It's going to get the whole crew into trouble. And on top of that, they're going to resent him for a while based on some of the decisions he makes. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not going to be a situation where he can get bailed out. It's going to be a decision that he makes that really impacts them. And uh, I, I think that, I'm kind of feeling that way based on how he's been presented, but also based on there's got to be a lesson taught. And uh, I think that's a, a fine lesson for kids. Let me ask you a quick question for everybody. Do you hope to find out what race he is, or would you like that to remain a mystery the whole season? I want to find would, out. Yeah, I think it would be cool. I want to find out at some point. Mm-hmm. I think it would make for some, an interesting plot point. Maybe it's tied mm-hmm. to some other development. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but I, I think that I don't want to know just yet. Yeah. I feel like there's a mystery for a reason. So yeah. I feel like there has to be a payoff at some point down the road. Ooh, theory. Maybe they end up on his planet in some episode. And that's, that's how a, he finds out. That's, that's very a good possible. theory. Ah. Oh, see, you got it. <laughs> you. You got it. Nailed it. Uh, and speaking of finding out what race uh, an alien is, uh, just a little while ago, Aaron Walkie posted on uh on Twitter, Aaron, one of the uh, producers of Prodigy, that uh, nobody has guessed what Murph is yet, or nobody has guessed correctly what Murph is yet. So we got to figure out what Murph is. He said that it's a deep cut in Star Trek lore. So uh, I think we, I think we need to assign somebody to figure this out. And I think her name is Emily. <laughs> Seconded. Uh, yep. Thirded. There you I go. A reason to go and watch a bunch of Star Trek. You needed a reason. <laughs> and you get to skip school to do it. No, I'm <laughs> no, kidding. I'm <laughs> kidding. Uh, although she does take many breaks during the day to watch TV. So I don't know what you're talking about. All right, Em, why don't you give us a preview of what we're going to encounter with the gallant, the gallant, the gallant crew of the USS Protostar next week. Even with the guidance of their hologram advisor, Janeway, the crew of the Protostar is tested when their ship is on a dangerous cosmic collision course. Join us next week as we analyze episode two of Prodigy Starstruck. Don't forget that you can support Discovering Trek and the Trek Geeks podcast network by subscribing to bonus content on Patreon. Get access to unedited audio of all our podcasts and a lot of other perks. If you'd like to support this and the other member podcasts of the Trek Geeks podcast network, beam on over to patreon.com slash Trek Geeks, where subscriptions start as low as $2 a month. And for more great Star Trek discussion, check out the aforementioned member podcasts on the network. In addition to discovering Trek, there's this show called trek geeks i think that's what it is never heard of it Uh, there's a there's a there's a couple of guys on there that they talk about everything and nothing at the same time and they're not very good (laughs) yeah but we'll highlight the other shows rewind politrex uh five-year mission which is aptly named deep space pride infinite trek the divine treasury sci-fi sisters and the newest shows drawn to trek science station two and with the first link you can find all these shows and where to listen on trekgeeks.com slash listen or by downloading the trek geeks mobile app the trek geeks podcast network no one i dare say no one talks trek like we do
perfect. He didn't even need a copy for that. I mean, you'd think he's done this before. <laughs> yeah, maybe a time or two. Episode one of Prodigy was a wild ride that we hope continues into next week and throughout the season. Join us again next week for a younger co-host as we welcome the Divine Treasury co-host Jamie Rogers and his son Blake on Discovering Trek Prodigy. And in the words of Dan Davidson, until then, never stop discovering. Music for Discovering Trek is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Discovering Trek is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app.